Hello, and this is the Midwest presentation from the 2017 Midwest meetings titled The Effects of Dietary Standardized Ileal Digestible Isoleucinolysine Ratio on Growth Performance of 6 to 11 Kilogram Nursery Pigs. To begin, isoleucine is considered to be the sixth limiting amino acid in common corn and soybean meal swine diets. Furthermore, the economical addition of synthetic phalene typically makes isoleucine the next limiting amino acid. And although synthetic or crystalline isoleucine is available, it is perhaps not yet economical in these nursery diets. The NRC recommends a ratio of about 52% standardized ileal digestible isoleucine to lysine ratio for nursery pigs weighing about 7 to 11 kilograms. However, a challenge that often comes with titrating isoleucine for these requirement experiments is that diets that are lower in isoleucine may often be high in other branch chain amino acids, particularly leucine, which is, has a known catabolic effect on isoleucine and thus could artificially inflate its requirement. Furthermore, Recent technological advances in the way that dose-response relationships are modeled statistically uh, have become available, particularly those that are detailed by the Journal of Animal Science paper by Gonsalves and others, in which these new techniques can apply heteroscedasticity or the heterogeneity of variants, meaning each treatment can have different residual variants around the mean, and then also using a mixed modeling framework. And, and the use of these two practices would ideally give more accurate statistical results than before. Um, and, and furthermore, we are evaluating models for specific growth responses to create these dose response relationships with confidence intervals. Uh, rather than just generating a single point requirement, we might model average daily gain and feed efficiency and characterize that dose response from the low end to the high end of that amino acid. Therefore, the objective of the two experiments that we'll discuss in this presentation were to determine the standardized ileal digestible isoleucine to lysine ratio requirement for 6 to 11 kilogram nursery pigs. The objective or the materials and methods, excuse me, for these two experiments are extremely similar, so we will go more in depth on experiment one and less so for the materials and methods on experiment two. That being said, this was conducted at the K-State University home farm using about 300 nursery pigs weaned at 21 days of age. They would have been placed in the nursery and fed a common starter pellet for six days prior to beginning their experimental treatments, which lasted for 12 days. And these pens would have been assigned to treatment in a randomized complete block design. Now the seven treatments differed only in SID isoleucine to lysine ratio, ranging from 40% on the low end all the way up to 63% on the high end. Again, uh, a reference point that 52% recommended requirement is right in the middle uh, with hopes that we would characterize a response with, a, with having low and a high range around the requirement. And these diets were formulated to 1.28 SID lysine so that they were just limiting in lysine. These diets contained 10% dried whey as a typical uh, nursery diet at this phase would, and they also incorporated 10% field peas and 1.5% spray dried blood cells. And now the use of these two ingredients allowed the isoleucine levels to decrease all the way down to the 40%. However, the use of the field peas in particular helped us mediate the increase in other branch chain amino acids as we discussed in the beginning, particularly leucine. So we mediated uh, that, that increase and imbalance in the branch chains via the use of field peas. Here we can see the dietary treatments, and it's important to note that these diets were blended diets, so I'm showing you the low and the high diets because at the feed mill we would have manufactured these basal treatments and then blended to create the five intermediate treatments, thus allowing for any potential discrepancies that can occur during the feed manufacturing process uh, to be 
hopefully avoided. Um, so once again, you'll see their corn and soy diets that include dried whey. However, once again, we did use field peas and spray dried blood cells. Other amino acids were um, included and the only difference really between these two treatments would be the use of synthetic uh, isoleucine. Next, we'll see the calculated analysis. And again, 1.28% um, to be second limiting in lysine and other essential amino acids would have been formulated just above uh, their requirements so as not to be limiting. To analyze the statistics, uh, I mentioned the paper by Gonsalves and others in the introduction. We would have used these methods in which a base model uh, was formed in Proc-Glimix, and then results would have been considered significant at P less than 0.05. And so in this base model, we would have applied heterogeneous variance if necessary, and then continued to model the response with three biologically explainable models uh, that will include the quadratic or the QP, the broken line linear or the BLL, and the broken line quadratic models. And these would have been uh, distinguished in SAS as a better or worse fitting model by a value generated called the Bayesian Information Criterion, um, which was the subjective means of identifying which model fit the data the best. Anything within two units of the BIC would be considered a competing model. So with that, we'll start right into the experimental period performance of the first experiment. Again, it was a 12-day period when the experimental diets were fed. And I'd like to start by reviewing the average daily feed intake for these pigs. Uh, current knowledge about branch chain amino acids, we know that being deficient in branch chains severely impacts feed intake. And as you can see, when pigs were below about the 52% level, there was a severe detriment to their intake and they uh, they consumed very poorly. However, after the 52%, uh, we really don't see that maintained intake, uh, hence there being a quadratic response. And this um, would have kind of translated into a linear response and average daily gain, with which increasing up to 52, we saw the most improved average daily gain and um, some variation as we go up to 63%. There was a slight quadratic response uh, for these pigs in feed efficiency with which the lowest and the highest treatments did have the Im most improved feed efficiency with some uh, slight numeric variation uh, in between. And because we, we can't necessarily biologically explain this response and we wouldn't have expected it for this experiment, we will not model uh, feed efficiency. With that being said, we'll dive into the modeling results for experiment one. Here we are looking at the data uh, models for average daily gain. So across the x-axis, you'll see the dietary treatments, and on the y-axis, the response, in this case, average daily gain. The data you see plotted is pen means, and although they do display variation, it allows the model to fit, uh, find a better fit for the data. And so with that introduction to these modeling charts, you'll see in this particular graph, there are three best fitting models. However, you'll note that the broken line linear and the broken line quadratic both broke at 52% SID isoleucine to lysine. The quadratic maximum was a bit higher at about 65%. However, we can um, choose a number to arbitrarily scale this response Two, and so 99% of this maximum performance in average daily gain was captured using 57% isoleucine lysine ratio. Next, looking at the modeling results for average daily feed intake for the first experiment, you'll see in this case two best fitting models, the quadratic polynomial, which had a maximum at about 56%, However, again, 99% of that maximum was at about 52. And then the broken line linear, which broke at 51% in this case. With that, we'll move into experiment two. Um, really, this was conducted to verify that um, fluctuation in response that we saw in the growth, perhaps after the 52%, as we would not have expected that, and uh, the variation we saw in feed efficiency. So extremely similar materials and methods, exact same number of pigs, 
fed the treatment diets just a bit longer to hit that target weight range. Um, but again, we used seven treatment diets, increasing all the way up um, from 40 to 63%. So with that, we'll dive into the experiment results for experiment two. Again, an 18-day experimental period. And we'll start again with average daily feed intake, in which you'll notice another quadratic response. And so once more, we see that pigs fed under the 52% isoleucine to lysine ratio uh, did eat very poorly. And that intake that was improved up to 52 was not maintained um, to, to that level after. This drove a quadratic response in average daily gain. Again, most improved average daily gain up to 52% and some, uh, a, a really a decrease thereafter. Um, and in this particular experiment, there was no evidence for differences in the gain to feed ratio in feed efficiency. So to wrap up the modeling results for the second experiment, uh, beginning with average daily gain again, we see that the broken line linear broke at 52%. And this would have been extremely similar to the breakpoint that the broken lines found for average daily gain in the first experiment. Furthermore, uh, the quadratic was a bit higher at 58%. However, 99% of that maximum was at 54.3%. And next, for average daily feed intake, you'll see two best fitting models once again. The broken line quadratic broke at 52 once more, and the quadratic polynomial was a bit higher at 57.2%. However, 99% of the average daily feed intake, according to that curve, was captured using 53.5%. So to conclude, data from these experiments tell us that the estimated SID isoleucine lysine requirement for pigs of this weight range was pretty consistent at about 52% using the broken line models. However, when the quadratic models were best fitting, it was a bit higher, almost as high as 64%. So using the data from this experiment, we could formulate to 52% and ideally capture 100% of the average daily gain performance while also capturing 99% of the intake, which uh, would certainly be an ideal scenario. And so as we talk about uh, characterizing these dose-response relationships, we are beginning to shift language from predicting responses um, versus predicting requirements. So rather than generating one individual number, um, that's the end-all be-all requirement. It, now that we can understand the response and where the performance may fall on either side of that um, estimated requirement, so we can generate this entire response curve and thus hopefully uh, then incorporate economics so as to make uh, the best decisions for producers or production systems. And then lastly, uh, another perhaps advantage of using these models is that we are considering models for both growth or intake or feed efficiency, and then again, factor in economics and costs, uh, as well as return, and then hopefully make the best decisions there again. So with that, I thank you for watching this presentation.